Normally, when the president of the United States orders something, it's done. So why is Mr. Biden flying halfway across the country to announce vaccine mandates after already announcing them a month ago? I'm Leland Bitter. Good evening. Today, the president visited a construction company here in Chicago to encourage employers to mandate the vaccine and threatened if they didn't, rules and fines and government regulation was coming. The Labor Department is going to shortly issue an emergency rule, which I asked for several weeks ago, and they're going through the process, to require all employees with more than 100 people, whether they work for the federal government or not. That was today. If you're a little confused and thinking, didn't he already say that? Aren't vaccine mandates already a thing? You aren't confused. You are paying attention. He did announce it, but there was never a date put on it. Let's go to the way back machine. Here is Mr. Biden on September 9th during his big COVID speech. I'm announcing that the Department of Labor is developing an emergency rule to require all employers with 100 or more employees that together employ over 80 million workers to ensure their workforces are fully vaccinated. Why is the president announcing something he already announced a month ago? Simply put, the White House hasn't figured out how to make that announcement a reality. It turns out trying to use an obscure federal agency to radically change the lives of 100 million Americans is easier said than done. Here is the White House press secretary last week admitting that things are just getting a little complicated. The rate of new vaccinations right now is as low as it was in July, despite the renewed push uh, from the White House and the new encouragement for vaccine mandates. Are these mandates working? The OSHA requirements or the OSHA regulations, uh, which uh, we hope to see more, uh, have more detail on in the coming weeks, have not yet even been implemented for businesses of over 100. This brings to light a basic truth. The president could issue sweeping vaccine mandates, but doesn't want the political blowback. Let me explain. Here was the original plan. Back in September, have the Occupational Safety and Health Administration require companies with more than 100 employees to require vaccines or testing for employees or face fines. Back then, at that time, we noted, good luck. OSHA's new rules will face huge obstacles. They have court challenges. Those are coming and pushback from employers. That's already happening. Not to mention mass confusion. Example, the speech today. Essentially, the president's announcement on September 9th was more of an aspiration than a law or policy. But over the past month, a lot of businesses put in mandates anyway. Why? Well, the president's announcement gave them cover from angry employees. Other employers didn't want the fight. As you might remember, back then, on September 9th, the president sounded awfully upset. You've been patient, but our patience is wearing thin. And your refusal has cost all of us. Patience wearing thin was something that got a lot of discussion back then. Today, he doubled down. The fact is, this has been a pandemic of the unvaccinated. Unvaccinated. The unvaccinated overcrowd our hospitals, overrunning emergency rooms and intensive care units. I've tried everything in my power to get people vaccinated. Everything in my power. There are genuine questions about the veracity of that statement, mostly because the president's actions don't back it up. As again, we noted on September 9th, and we'll remind you, without waiting for OSHA or lawyers, Mr. Biden could require vaccines for entering airports, air travel, federal buildings, and trains. The vaccine requirements could be tied to federal funding for mass transit. The vaccine requirements could be tied to federal education money possibly tie vaccine requirements to federal entitlement programs like welfare or Medicaid or food stamps. All things that would get a lot more people vaccinated than reannouncing that in a few weeks, some federal agency might announce some rule which could then be challenged. Full disclosure, I almost died from COVID before the vaccine was available. It was awful. I'm now triple vaccinated. And I must admit, I'm a little puzzled by those who choose not to get the shot, but I believe it is their right not to. In a larger sense on the show, we take no position on which policy Mr. Biden should pursue. 
But please, don't tell the American people you are doing everything you can when you clearly are not. In fairness, infringing on the rights of the unvaccinated to enjoy everyday activities is a tough choice. But we elected you, Mr. President, Mr. Biden, to make that call. Who better to bring in on such a contentious issue than Adam Carolla, host of one of America's top podcasts. Adam, good to see you. We like to say on the show that uh, two things can be true at once. Why is it so hard to be pro-vaccine and believe it works, but also be against vaccine mandates? Well, I think it's a pretty easy thing to do. And I think folks on the left have been doing this for a long time on many different subjects. If you think about pornography, or prostitution or drug use, you know, they would go, well, I don't want my daughter to become a prostitute, but it should be legal or decriminalized. And I don't want my son to be a heroin addict, but it should be. So it's nuanced, but we can wrap our brains around, here's what we'd want, but here's the world we want to live in. And they go full ad hominem with you. So you go, look, I believe in vaccines. I'm vaccinated. I just don't like the government getting involved and forcing my kids to get vaccine vaccinated before they go to school. And they go, oh, you're an anti-vaxxer. Well, again, there are many other social issues that they were able to take nuanced approaches to for many, many years yeah. leading up into this. And it's the same approach, I would argue. Almost it's as if right now you're getting some on the left who are saying the quiet part uh, out loud. Here is a CNN medical analyst talking about how they want to have vaccine mandates on airplanes where it's almost impossible to get COVID on a plane. We know that. But now she's saying essentially this is more about punishment than protection. Take a listen. We really need every tool at our disposal at this point. We've already tried incentives, we tried outreach and education, especially with holidays coming. It will be a powerful incentive for people mm -hmm. to say, look, you can stay unvaccinated if you want, but you're not going to be able to travel to see your family. I guess they're admitting now this is more, much more about arm twisting and punishment than public health. And also, just listen to what that sounds like. I've been telling you what to do for a long time. I've told you this. I'm trying this. I decreed this. And you wouldn't do it. So now it's time to get tough. You think that's how this country works? You just make a decree. And if half the country doesn't listen to you, now it's time to punish those people. Do you want to live in that country? It's such a they're, they're, they, they take this sort of high ground, this sort of moral high ground, and a, because they said it, it's a decree, and we should all get in line. They don't realize that that kind of talk flies in the face of why this country was established. And it's interesting to listen to folks uh, talk about the, the unvaccinated, because if you listen to other cable networks, uh, some say the unvaccinated are heroes, others say the unvaccinated are tin hat wearing or red hat wearing conspiracy theorists. But it's a little more complicated than this. This is what Politico pointed out uh, in their graph, unvaccinated already gotten, 12% definitely won't, 7% wait and see. It seems as though only 4% say to people that it will they will get the vaccine if required. Uh, that doesn't really seem to say that many of these uh, mandates that we're talking about is going to make much of a difference. Well, I think what they're creating, and I think what this crazy government overreach that's been going on for coming on to two years now is creating is a lot of people that are saying, I'm not going to be pushed around by the government anymore. You guys have made a million mandates. I'm in California. They closed down outdoor dining. And so here's the thing. Be very judicious when you're giving out mandates that don't make any sense. Because once you get to 10 things that don't make any sense, they arrested someone for paddle boarding in the Malibu Bay uh, a year ago. You do a bunch of stuff that doesn't make sense, and then you want us to do it all. Well, that what that's going to create is a bunch of people going, you know what, I'm not listening anymore. Yeah, well, there, that certainly has started. Uh, and a lot of people say, I'm not listening. I'm pushing back just because you're telling me what to do. I used to do that when my parents told me to uh, go to bed. Adam, thank you very much. Great conversation as always. Talk to you soon, my friend. Thanks, Leland. All right, cheers.
Even some liberal commentators in Chicago are upset that the president didn't mention crime in Chicago during his visit. Consider the statistics. Gun violence is about as deadly as COVID this month in Chicago. The city saw 12 murders in the past week, nearly two per day. Meantime, 24 people died of COVID last week, roughly three per day. Gun violence is proving to be a much larger threat to children in Chicago. As of last month, more than 30 kids have died in shootings so far, compared to just six who have died from COVID. The president's visit comes at a time when the city's top leadership is at odds over a gang shootout caught on tape. One gang member died, two more were injured, and the state's attorney so far has not charged anyone. Ben Bradley, an anchor on Chicago's top-rated WGN-TV, our sister station here, joins us now. Uh, the state attorney, Kim Fox, here seems to be on an island on this one. Yeah, she doesn't have a lot of friends, both politically among her fellow Democrats or certainly among the folks who want to see crime um, diminished in Chicago. She's one of these progressive prosecutors, excuse me, <clears throat> who came in and said, we're going to focus on the most violent crime. The problem is then you have a situation like this, a shootout caught on camera, and the state's attorney said, well, they were mutual combatants. It was hard to know who was defending themselves, who was the aggressor. And, Chicago, and she said, not that I'm not going to charge people there, but that we need more evidence to determine who and what to charge. A lot of folks are saying, well, at the very least, you could have hit them with unlawful possession of gun charges, possession of a stolen vehicle. There are other ways to charge versus just the top line charge. It's interesting. You say she's on an island, both in terms of the mayor, uh, mm -hmm. but also in terms of now the police chief. Take a listen. Okay, and you get a pass that you shoot up a resident in broad daylight, captured on film, and no consequences will happen for you. I find myself here today having to respond to a narrative that was given by the mayor yesterday regarding a case that is still under investigation. It was inappropriate. What is the impact of a failure to charge anything on a case like this? Lawlessness is the impact. Lawlessness. I, I agree with you. We should pursue the charges that we have and let jurors and judges uh, adjudicate justice. Ben, we don't often cover a local story on, on the program, but Chico violence in Chicago has become a national story now, as has Kim Fox's policies is emblematic of what's happening in so many other cities. Do you feel that we are now at an inflection point in the city? I would hope so, but then again, I would have hoped so when we had a little girl named Ryan Harris murdered on our city streets nearly 20 years ago. Everyone thinks this will be the issue that changes it, and I'm sorry to say time and time again, it's been proven that nothing has been able to change it. It's very easy to score political points, to have politicians ripping on Chicago nationally. You know what? Violent crime up across the country. Chicago, not among the most violent per capita cities in the country, but we do have a significant violence problem. And the question I think for our leadership is, at what point do you say it's not working when a guy is picked up on a gun charge and he's out the next day? But this is not just a Chicago problem. As you for know, sure. Leland. My hometown, the, St. Louis, even worse. The kid who was charged yesterday with sh shooting at that school in Texas, he's already out on bond. He shot three people. And you know what? And it's, a a to school. it's a Republican county prosecutor there in Tarrant County, Texas. So this is an issue that needs to be addressed across the country, and it's a tough one to tackle. Yeah, for sure. Uh, sanguine points, uh, as always, Ben. Appreciate you taking mm -hmm. the time. Uh, it's raining outside, so I'm not sure your son's going to be able to play <laughs> soccer, but get, get over Let's there hope. anyway. Thank oh, you. Right. I expect highlights tomorrow. Yeah. You know what? Send us a picture. We'll, <laughs> let it, we'll, let it, we'll see how the game goes. Tomorrow... The Mexico president hosts the U.S. Secretary of State, Homeland Security, and, Sec and Attorney General on one of the biggest issues on their agenda is going to be illegal immigration and the tens of thousands of migrants on the move right now through Mexico towards our southern border. And we want to come over to the touch screen right now to show you exactly what's happening on the border. We've been talking a lot about how the crisis on the border continues to move. Remember, last week we were down here in Mission, Texas. We were there because in Del Rio, you had those 15,000 Haitians under a bridge in Del Rio. That meant that all the Border Patrol and Customs officers went to Del Rio. So 
everybody now in mission could come across the border essentially unchecked. The cartels really took advantage of that. Now, if you go all the way over here to Yuma, Arizona, 835 miles away from Del Rio, same situation happening here. Why? Because the customs officers and Border Patrol have yet to come back from Del Rio to Yuma. Cartels are not stupid. That's where they are right now. Some of the guys are still left in mission, filling that gap. So Yuma, Arizona is now the hot spot. What's going to happen in Yuma? The next crisis is almost upon us as we mix, switch to the next map and show you. These are the routes of about 60,000 Haitian immigrants that are coming from Brazil and from Chile. They're here through the Darien Gap. This is the area in Panama they've transited. They're going to leave from, with this caravan, southern Mexico in about a week or two, and then head up either to Del Rio or over here to Yuma, Arizona. Already, there are some Haitians who are coming up through sort of the beginnings of this caravan to Yuma, Arizona. Jorge Ventura, a border reporter for the Daily Caller that we check in with often. Few people understand the situation at the border like Jorge. He joins us now. Jorge, uh, as always, we're not sure where you're going to pop up. It is going to be in one of these monitors. Is Jorge here? There's Jorge. He has come into, he's come to the monitor. Uh, Jorge, good to see you, uh, as always, my friend. Uh, there was some video that you had earlier uh, of smugglers being paid just out there in the open. Are these guys getting more and more brazen? Uh, that's what we're seeing here, Leland. So right here, I'm actually in the Yuma sector. Uh, I'm in a location known as The Gap. And the reason that it's called The Gap is you can literally see the gap of border wall. And these human smugglers, Leland, are actually coming up to the, even to the Colorado River and guiding these migrants across illegally into the United States. You can see in that video the Cuban migrants paying cash to that human smuggler before making their way into this human sector. And actually, Leland, as we're speaking right now, right behind us, we actually have a group of Haitian migrants walking along the dam through the Colorado River. So just in about five minutes or so, they're actually going to be here at the human sector crossing illegally. And that's what we're starting to see here. We we're speaking to Border Patrol agents, and they said that they actually been seeing the huge influx of migrants of a Haitian migrant influx here in the Yuma sector that they're starting to come in here. So it's not just states like Texas that are being impacted by the border crisis or the huge Haitian migrant surge. The Haitians are starting to make their way here into Yuma. Like I said, Leland, just over my shoulder, we could see now those Haitians are actually walking through the water in the Colorado River. And like I said, they're about just five minutes and they'll be so here in uh, Yuma, they, Arizona. Once they get into Yuma, uh, what happens to them? Well, what's going to happen, Leland, is they're, they're just going to wait off here and they're, they're actually going to wait for the border patrol. So these are the migrants that actually want to be apprehended and they want to be processed by the uh, border patrol agents. So one thing that we'll see here in a, in a bit is the border patrol is going to come, take down the information of these migrants and then transport them to a facility and most likely release them to the United States, just like what we saw when the Haitians under that bridge, when Mayorkas announced that 12,000 of those Haitians living on the bridge got processed and released into the United States. It's stunning how it just happens live on television. And this is not unusual. When we were down on the border together in mission, we saw uh, the very same thing. Uh, some want to turn themselves in, which conceivably this is group is going to. This person uh, probably did not want to turn themselves in. Uh, also in the Yuma sector, Yuma sector agents arrested a child rapist that illegally entered the United States on Monday. Uh, are you hearing from the Border Patrol that it's difficult to, to check and to process everybody and uh, deal with everybody? Is, your, uh, is there overwhelmed? Are there child rapists who are not getting caught? Yeah, so the sources here are saying that they, the agents here in this sector have been overwhelmed just because of a huge spike in increase. Uh, Yuma last year in the month of August, they've only encountered 694 agents. Compare that to August 2021, they've encountered over 17,000 migrants. That's already a 2,000% increase. And agents say that the yet is worse to come as more Haitians are going to be trickled in. And just one more time, Leland, like I said, those Haitians are getting a little bit closer here, making their way through that Colorado River, and they'll be here in Yuma, in the Yuma, Arizona, and shortly. Uh, but like I said, the Yuma border agents are, are expecting the worst as the uh, influx yeah. is hey, starting right, to get I just wanted, here. We weren't able to put this up earlier, but it's a call for for uh, the smugglers being paid. Uh, it doesn't seem that it requires a lot of smuggling to walk across a river. Uh, is this more of like a tithe because the cartels control the river? Or what do these smugglers get for their payment? Well, here what, what, what we're seeing is that, you know, smugglers get, get their fee just to at least direct the migrants and get them to this location. This, so this is a location that they've had nicknamed called the Gap in Yuma. And just like I said, it's called the Gap because you can easily see the huge gap in border wall. And we're, we're still trying to find out information of how these migrants find out about this new route here. 
but this is one of the new routes here that agents are telling telling us and we're not only running into haitians we're running into the constant flow of central americans venezuelans we've also met some uh, migrants wow. coming from Nicaragua and Cuba as well uh, that are now taking advantage of this route. Yeah. But you can see there, uh, Leland, those Haitians are getting close here to uh, the, the Yuma, Arizona um, soil here, and they'll soon be here on American land. Yeah. Uh, as you point out, so many people from all across South America and the rest of the world saw what happened to the Haitians under the bridge and are now uh, headed towards America. Or, hey, great work. We'll talk to you soon, my friend. Thank you, Leland. All right. The government isn't going to default on its debt, at least not for another couple of months. Will Democrats, though, reach a deal on their spending plans? Now they've pulled out the it's not fair excuse. First, is the mafia getting soft? The texts that show made men just aren't like they used to be. Never thought I'd read this. But it's a great story. Old school mobsters evidently don't really like the way or respect or appreciate the way new millennial mafioso are heading. Some say the next generation is going too soft. Example, using threatening text messages instead of fists and pistol whips. This was the reporting from the Wall Street Journal and one of the text messages uh, they got. All right, one alleged mobster sent a threatening text to a union official saying, hey, this is the second text there isn't going to be a third. Join us now, Arthur Idala, who used to prosecute a lot of mobsters before he came to the defense bar. Uh, boy, texts like that are a prosecutor's dream, huh? Well, yeah, there's a te modern technology has done so much to fight crime. I mean, I was a prosecutor uh, in the early 90s when crime was through the roof here in New York City, and we didn't have any of the tools that uh, that exist today, including these these you know, these trails that they uh, they leave. I mean, there's a character in a, the movie The Bronx Tale, which I think is a fantastic movie, and his name is Jimmy Whispers, because he whispered everything to everyone, because back then they didn't have any equipment, and that's a movie set in the 50s, to pick up anyone's words. Uh, now, you know, they, these guys are wearing watches that have recording devices in them, or wearing lapel pins that have recording devices in them. Uh, actually, actually, one of the biggest cases that uh, the federal government brought down had to do with a guy wearing a Rolex that uh, had recording equipment. But Leland, you know, I did some investigating before I came on with you, speaking to some literally, literally top law enforcement officials in this field of organized crime, and they basically said that Italian uh, American organized crime is almost obvious. Obsolete. Uh, one, one of the terms the detective, the former detective said was, they used to make presidents. Now you're lucky if they can make you a reservation in a restaurant that's hard to get into. Um, <laughs> okay. what, I, what I did learn, what I did learn was that the, the, the organized crime groups that they're really combating now have to do with the, uh, uh, people of Russian descent, Asian descent, and within the prison system of Mexican descent. And that's really where their focus is now more than ever. Um, regarding the topic you brought up, I mean, society is getting softer, right? Mickey right. Mantle used to ride, used to ride the bus to Yankee Stadium and, and then play a game. And then, you know, if his toe hurt, he'd go get a, a Budweiser and put it on his toe. Now you guys get, guys get paying $300 million contracts and they, they pitch for two innings and then they sit on the bench. Yeah. So I think okay, it's fair, accurate fair to say I everyone's think, getting soft. It's interesting, though. The, the Italian mob is obsolete. And I'm just thinking about the, the names, Colombo, Gambino, uh, Genovese, all these, all these old mobster names. I only got about 30 seconds left. What happened to them all if, uh, you know, it wasn't so, text, so the text messages that brought them down no. or something else? No, two things. Number one, quickly, is that it, it was just the, the American dream, so to speak. When the organized crime started in the 1930s, they were being tremendously discriminated against in the 30s, in the 40s, in the 50s. Now Italian Americans are presidents, almost presidents, uh, you know, vice president, presidents' wives, and governors, and mayors. And these people, they don't want those lives. They don't want to go to prison anymore. So it's, it's, they're, they don't want to be there. And also, technology and the focus, particularly by Rudy Giuliani, when he was the, the attorney, uh, when yeah, he was great the point about, boss, yeah, you great know, point about Giuliani. Focusing right in on that, that was his whole, that was his whole thing that he wanted to do, and he did it quite successfully. Yeah, great point about Giuliani, and also a scary one that people have taken their place now. Uh, Arthur, always a good conversation, my friend. Nice to see you. Thanks, Lynn. Yeah, be well. Th thank you. All right, time to stock up. It might be tougher to get your favorite breakfast cereal in the coming months. We'll tell you why. 
Plus, Senator Bernie Sanders is pulling out the oldest argument in the book why he says stalling the spending plan just isn't fair. In case you were worried the crisis has been averted on Capitol Hill, at least for now, Senate Minority Leader Mitch McConnell has buckled to pressure and agreed to allow Democrats to extend the debt ceiling by $480 billion through December, but setting up for yet another partisan showdown, this time right around Christmas. So stay tuned. If you have a car, though, you probably are already feeling like you might need to go into debt just to fill it up. Drivers are facing the highest gas prices in seven years. The average price for gasoline hit $3 and 22 cents a gallon nationally. Last time we saw that was October of 2014. In some states, it's a lot higher. In California, the average is $4.50 a gallon, tops $5 in some areas. But having to fork over more money to fill up the tank is just one of the many rising costs Americans now face. We're just learning how bad inflation has become. It kind of lags in terms of the data. The average American household now pays an extra $175 a month in costs for things like food, fuel, and housing. That's according to the chief economist at Moody's Analytics, who came up with that data. All right, so at least in terms of Washington, Republicans blinked on the debt ceiling, and now Democrats have returned to the circular firing squad, arguing over new spending on social programs. And Senator Bernie Sanders is upset at Democrats Joe Manchin and Kristen Sinema for blocking the $3.5 trillion bill. I know a lot of the media talks about, you know, compromise and all that stuff. We got 48 senators who support three and a half trillion. We got two who do not. But it is wrong. It is really not playing fair that one or two people think that they should be able to stop what 48 members of the Democratic caucus want, what the American people want, what the president of the United States wants. The argument is it's not fair. Certainly Bernie Sanders understands how democracy works. This is not horseshoes. Close does not count. You need a majority. It is not two versus 48. It is 52 against 48. Michael Starr Hopkins, former National Press Secretary for Democratic Congressman John Delaney's presidential campaigns. He understands how democracy works. We're glad to have you. Uh, all right, we'll put aside sort of the semantics for a second. But what does it say that the argument has now come down to it's not fair? I, this isn't recess. Can't we may have a better argument? Well, I think at the end of the day, the real conversation needs to be about where our priorities lay. When the conversation is about how we spend money, how we budget, it shows where our priorities are. And at the end of the day, making sure that kids have access to affordable health care, making sure that we have good education, and making sure that you know the elderly have things like dental care and eye care, I think that's really the conversation that we need to be focusing on. Uh, as you point out, Governing is about priorities. It's about budgets. The Republicans have said 1.2 trillion is enough. We don't need the 3.5 trillion dollar bill. Listen to Mitch McConnell. First and foremost, we know their reckless legislation would hurt American families and actually help China. It's that simple. Inflicting pain on American workers and families while putting us at a global disadvantage. I know you're going to disagree with him on, on that point, but doesn't the fact that Manchin and Cinema are against this say perhaps Democrats actually need to negotiate on the $3.5 trillion bill rather than just continuing to whine about it? Well, when it comes to Senator Cinema, I think we're all kind of up in the air and wondering where she stands on it because she hasn't publicly actually... Uh, you know, made a case for where she stands. When it comes to uh, Senator Manchin, I think there's a conversation to be had about West Virginia and the constituents of West Virginia and the things that they need. And I think access to affordable health care is something that the people of Appalachia really need. And so Democrats need to figure out a way to come together and come to a compromise. It may not be 3.5 trillion, but it may be somewhere around 2.5 trillion or 2 trillion. Yeah. And Either you, way, you, we need to have a compromise. As you point out, things are going to have to come out of it. it you make an interesting point about Senator Sinema because she was, the, I guess you can call her the victim of real harassment. People chased her into a bathroom 
screamed at her, were recording her while she was using the facilities. Uh, and at the time, Cory Booker, senator from New Jersey, had his staff circulate a condemnation of that incident, saying, doesn't matter how you think about somebody's politics, you can't go chase people into bathrooms. Axios got a hold of some emails that Bernie Sanders refused to condemn cinema's harassment without putting in this. They wanted written in a condemnation of her politics along with condemning the people who harassed her. Uh, while we hope Senator Sinema will change her position on prescription drug reform is what uh, Bernie Sanders folks wrote back. Uh, that just, boy, you can't even condemn harassing some a woman in the bathroom without having to make a political point? Is that fair? Look, I don't... I don't think that following someone in the bathroom is appropriate, but I do think Senator Sinema owes it to the American public to tell us where she stands. The idea that she continues to be silent and only talks to lobbyists and people who are making donations to her is something that I think is something that people of Arizona clearly aren't supporting when you look at her poll numbers. And so no, no, I think while people need to be appropriate, there is an actual conversation about who her constituents are. Yeah, at least we can agree that the bathroom is probably not the right place to uh, have the conversation. Uh, Michael, good to see you, my friend. Always. Yeah, take care. Oh, for sure. Oh, Rice Krispies are such a beloved cereal. Even the Rolling Stones did a commercial for them. And this story is personal for me, perhaps for many of you too, once we tell you about it. You like Rice Krispies, you like Frosted Flakes, other Kellogg cereals, I do too. And now you may not be able to get them. That's certainly what the unions want us to be thinking right now. This video looks like something out of the 70s, but it is from outside one of the many Kellogg's factories around the United States that are shut down right now because of a nationwide strike. The union says their employees sacrificed work doubles during the height of the pandemic, and it's time for the cereal giant to pay up. Trevor Biddleman, fourth generation Kellogg's worker, local union president, joins us uh, now. All right, Trevor, what, what do you guys want from uh, Tigger the Tiger? Well, uh, basically our uh, fight here is about the future. Um, our future is not for sale. Uh, the company has been insisted upon a two-tier benefited system that will not allow some of our current workforce to get to the premium health care and also the pension. Um, they want to take that away for some of our current workforce, a path for that, and also all future workers. Um, they want to take away a cost of living provision, um, which is a wage adjustment that we have always had. So, so you guys, um, you guys want more money. The, the company doesn't want to give more money. Tony the Tiger. No, sir. Uh, you, no, sir. No, no, sir. You're, uh, no, we are not asking for more money, actually. Um, a well, cost of living wage adjustment is when things get more expensive. Okay, okay. I, I, Trevor, Trevor, more, I, we can, we can argue cheaper. semantics all the time. Hold on. Like, we can argue semantics okay. all the time in terms of it is, it's more money. That's fine. Uh, you're advocating for your employees. I understand. Tony, the, you guys have dressed Tony the Tiger up and saying it's all about greed. Do you feel this, this is the first strike, I think, at, this at some of these facilities since the 80s. Why do you feel now you've got the power to force Kellogg's hand? Um, I believe if you look at the labor market as it is and as hard as it is for every uh, company to get employees, um, they are not going to be able to find a, a, a workforce. I also think that the climate of the country is workers are standing up and everyone across the the entire nation is fed up with the elite taking everything. Um, you talk about uh, tax bases and money that's stored in, in offshore accounts that can be here helping America, and it's not. Um, you talk about CEOs making tens and 20 millions of dollars in a, in a single year when an average American uh, family, you have both parents having to work. Yeah, no, 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 Trevor, it, the, 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 the list of grievances, I understand. What you said and I thought was fascinating is how unions now really feel as though they've got an upper hand in this negotiation. Uh, the strike has just started. We're going to continue to follow it. Uh, and we'll talk again before it's over, all right? Yeah, OK. Sounds yeah. good. No, thank, thank you for your time. We really appreciate it. Yep, all thank right. you. There's new details right now in the search for Gabby Petito's missing fiance, Brian Laundrie's father, the father of the person who's wanted 
in connection with her disappearance. Join the search for his son today. Laundrie is now a person of interest in Petito's death. The couple left for a cross-country road trip, but last month, Brian returned to his parents' home in Florida without Gabby. This is video from today of Brian Laundrie's father going to the search area. Our Ashley Banfield is speaking to Gabby's father tonight. You want to catch that interview tonight, 10 Eastern, 9 Central with Ashley. It's going to be a fascinating, probably pretty sad conversation at times as well. All right, as we move on, newly reported information on U.S. troops in Taiwan. Joe Biden and Xi Jinping square off over that. Will there be war with China? And of all the people who should be punished for the sloppy Afghanistan withdrawal, the only one that has been is somebody who called for accountability. His case next. Did any of you throw your rank on the table and say, hey, it's a bad idea to evacuate Bagram Airfield, the strategic air barriers, before we evacuate everyone? Did anyone do that? And when you didn't think to do that, did anyone raise their hand and say, we completely messed this up? Some people have said they completely messed it up as of now, and evidently the president was advised of a few of those things. That was Lieutenant Colonel Stuart Scheller. He now faces a court martial for posting that video, among others, that went viral criticizing the U.S. withdrawal from Afghanistan. The Marine wasn't part of the botched withdrawal, yet he is the only person so far facing punishment for it, meaning that the only person facing punishment is those who asked for accountability for the crisis. Kevin Carroll served two combat tours in Afghanistan, now a national security attorney, among other things, in defense cases under the Uniform Code of Military Justice. If Kevin, if he had stopped uh, where he was right in that clip, would he still be facing six charges? I think he would be okay and should be okay if he'd stop with the first post. The first post, which got so much attention, he called for accountability, which may be uncomfortable to hear, but that's not illegal. But the subsequent posts, which he was ordered not to make, which are law is a lawful order, uh, veered off into the territory of calling for revolution. Uh, and you, you simply can't do that as a serving uniformed officer. So he spent a couple of uh, days in the brig. He's now been let out. So far, he hasn't posted, as far as we know, once... Uh, he got out. But this is a, a second video that he put up uh, after that order that you pointed out. I have a growing discontent and contempt for my perceived ineptitude at the foreign policy level. And I want to specifically ask some questions to some of my senior leaders. Uh, yeah, I don't think, like, you don't get to as a lieutenant colonel ask questions to senior leaders and show contempt, do you? No, and, and the word contempt is loaded because that is one of the punitive articles in the Uniform Code of Military Justice. He certainly could have uh, written Congress. He could have written an inspector general, um, but he wasn't allowed to do what he did in uniform on active duty in that video in which he also solicited money for himself. Yeah, that was another part of this is that there were some Facebook posts that really kind of veered into the wild part of things. Uh, is, is, I, let me ask it this way. Uh, is there another way to have dealt with this and that what he did was wrong, but maybe he doesn't need to go to jail? Absolutely. The thing that stood out to me from the first post is that he had just heard that one of his former subordinates was killed in that terrible attack in Kabul, and he was obviously and understandably bereaved. And I think this should have been dealt with in a compassionate way. Um, it, it might not be tenable for him to continue to stay in a leadership position in the Marine Corps, uh, but as a fellow veteran, uh, I, I think he should have been uh, dealt with from a more gentle and humanitarian point of view than dealing with it as a law enforcement or disciplinary problem alone. And it seems as though the reciprocity multiplier just kept going up. He said things and then leadership decided uh, they were just going to kind of finally show him and evidently they threw him in jail. Hey, Kevin, always a, a thoughtful uh, analysis of these things. We appreciate it, my friend. Thank you, Leland. All right, great to see you. Thank you. Up next, potential war with China may be a lot closer than you think. Welcome back. We are perhaps a lot closer to war with China than we ever thought or know, knew. In the past few hours, the Chinese have threatened airstrikes on American troops in Taiwan. Here's the quote. See whether the PLA will launch a targeted airstrike to eliminate those U.S. invaders. That's the editor of the Global Times, who serves as a mouthpiece of the Chinese Communist Party. The Chinese consider Taiwan a rogue breakaway province and threatened to reunify them with force. The rest of the world considers Taiwan 
a democratic outpost in sovereign country, 1,300 miles off the coast of China. All right, over here at the Breaking News Monitor to show you why this matters. This is where Taiwan is. We learned that there are about a couple of dozen U.S. Special Forces who have been in Taiwan now for about a year, training the Taiwanese to repel a possible invasion by the Chinese military. The Chinese want to reunify this island. And also, in the past couple of weeks, the Chinese have been flying fighter jets and bombers through this area right here, harassing the Taiwanese as well and testing their air defenses and response. With that, we bring in John Moody, former colleague and head of news at Fox News, is reported from various points around the world as the Rome bureau chief. He is the author of the new book, Of Course They Knew, fiction book, but plays a big role with China. Uh, John, good to see you. Why do you think uh, just now we're learning about these Marines in Taiwan? One year, is the leak a coincidence? No coincidence at all, Leland. Uh, great to see you again, by the way. Um, look, China and the U.S. are sending each other signals. They're sending essentially coded messages. Uh, the presence of these uh, trainers in Taiwan, American trainers, is to tell the Chinese, we're here, do not mess with Taiwan, do not mess with us. China, on the other hand, is sending a message that says, we don't care who you are, we don't care where you are, Taiwan is ours, we're going to take it back eventually, it might not be tomorrow, but it's sure that we're going to take it back. These are, this is a game of chicken that China and the U.S. is playing. And with, with a whole lot of nuclear weapons uh, in the middle of that, those are the coded messages, and that, that's what's happening sort of behind closed doors or in newspapers. Uh, this is the public message, Ned Price, State Department spokesman earlier today. Take a listen. We strongly urge Beijing to cease its military, diplomatic, and economic pressure um, and coercion against Taiwan. We've said this many times before, but our commitment to Taiwan is rock solid. Uh, and it contributes, we believe, to the maintenance of peace and stability across the Taiwan Strait uh, and within the broader region as well. What we've never heard from the U.S. government is a formal declaration that the U.S. will protect Taiwan. They can't do it. Uh, they're, they're wedded to the one, ta one China policy. Uh, which means that they can only recognize Beijing as the official government of China. Part of that understanding, and again, it's just an understanding, is that the United States will uh, be there in Taiwan and will consider Taiwan something that is, has the right to protect. But uh, the one China policy as it now stands is probably not going to last if this is the kind of provocations that China is going to continue to make. It seems by all accounts they're going to keep making it until they are given a reason not to, and it certainly helps Xi Jinping uh, back at home. He's going to have a meeting with President Biden. Xi hasn't left China in almost two years now, which in and of itself is unusual. Uh, but he's going to have this virtual meeting with President Biden. What are the coded things you watch for? I, I think it's very interesting that the United States had to ask for this meeting. I mean, most foreign leaders look forward to having a chance to talk to the president of the United States. Xi Jinping had to be talked into it and then said, no, I'm not coming personally. Uh, I'll talk to you over the computer. Uh, it, it's, it's, a, it's China's attempt to reverse the order of importance and dominance in the world. They've humiliated two envoys from the United States recently. And I think President Biden would be well advised to watch out for what happens during this virtual meeting. Yeah, no, I, I, what, what will happen and what we'll see out of it uh, is going to be important. Uh, John, great to see you. Thanks for the time. Great book uh, that foreshadows a lot of what might come out of uh, some of these very issues. Good to see you, my friend. Thank you. All right, great conversation there. Tomorrow, we take a look at exactly what's happening to your wallet, especially as it relates to gas prices and how that is affecting the president's ability to get things done. We'll see you tomorrow night. Dan Abrams is next.